show your support. Like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome to my review of NXT TakeOver London. Now, I've done a couple of these already. I thought I'd go right back to the beginning with my first one and then because the other one fell around SummerSlam weekend, I thought I would take it to the beginning of that sequence of Brooklyn shows. So now we've kind of got that out the way and as I am that British guy, I thought now would be a fitting time to go to the one and only NXT show that they have done in Britain. Now this starts off with Triple H in the middle of the ring, the lights come up on him in the ring and he basically introduces the show to the crowd. He says, you called for it, so that's why we were here. Uh, this was at the end of a week-long tour that the WWE were doing, and the kind of the culmination of that was this NXT show, which is why it didn't kind of coincide with a main roster pay-per-view like they tend to now. We then get a short video package just giving us a tease for each of the five matches that are coming up later in the night. The first of those matches is Asuka and she is taking on Emma with Dana Brooke as her manager. Now Asuka hasn't been around for very long so they're playing up this kind of almost like a welcoming party that um, Emma and Dana Brooke have put in place just to kind of make her life a living hell. Basically Asuka had obviously come in with a huge fanfare and the WWE were putting over this women's revolution um, what with Charlotte and Sasha and Becky going up to the main roster now along with a couple of the other people that had kind of come down to NXT briefly and gone back up to the main roster pretty much leaving Bailey behind and Emma in fact she was one of the kind of pioneers she was around even sort of when Paige was around and was still down in NXT and she'd kind of seen that as a slight on her. Now the crowd were very much in Asuka's corner as you can expect Obviously with it being a UK crowd, uh, it was quite a smarky crowd, so they were very, very aware of what Asuka had done outside of NXT. So because of that, the crowd had quite a long history with her as a performer. Now there was quite a nice bit of chain wrestling at the beginning, and Emma was able to get the advantage fairly early on because of Dana Brooke's interference. And this kind of went on throughout the match, Emma making sure that she stayed on top of Asuka when she got kind of these little flurries of offence. Emma was able to kind of use Dana Brooke almost as a, a, an equaliser just to stay on top and to keep Asuka grounded. And as I was watching this match, all I was thinking more and more going, going through the match was I really, really miss Emma in WWE. Obviously, she's now out in the Indies as Tennille Dashwood, doing brilliant work. And I'm still, to this day, not really sure why they released her, whether there was some issue that they had with her personally, or she'd caused a bit of uh, issue with certain important people backstage. But I certainly didn't hear any reports of that when she was released, um, about a year ago now. And it's just a real shame watching these kind of older NXT shows. She always puts on a really, really good show. She knows her character really, really well. And hopefully within a few years she will make her way back there. Because I think she deserves to be put on that stage and pushed properly. Quite why she never became NXT champion. I guess we went from Bailey over to Asuka so there wasn't really time for her but maybe she could have done up on the main roster because she'd certainly put the years and years of work in. Um, it just never really came to fruition unfortunately. Now the end of the match was quite nice and clever. Dana Brooke had got a belt in position and was kind of passing it into the ring for Emma to use um, but Asuka and Emma were kind of having this tug of war while there was a ref bump and as Asuka kind of gets hold of the belt that's when the ref regains consciousness so they're kind of playing up the whole referee thinking that Asuka has laid Emma out with the belt which the crowd kind of shoot that down immediately and Asuka gets rid of the belt and that's kind of the end of that. 
Emma is then able to use this distraction to roll Asker up, um, but this is countered brilliantly into the Asker lock. And as Emma is tapping out, Dana Brooke manages to get the ref's attention as she is up on the apron. So you miss the visual pin. This obviously causes Asuka to release the Asuka lock and then there's kind of a stare down between her and Dana Brooke. Emma grabs the belt and it looks like she's going to blindside Asuka but she catches her. Hits her with this spinning roundhouse kick which she doesn't really do anymore. That was quite... Um, an over move at the time and they put it in the video package quite a lot that it was almost as, as kind of used as much as the Ascalock was but she doesn't really tend to do it now or if she does it's just a move rather than a finisher. Anyway she hits this on Emma and is able to pin her for the victory. We then quickly get a shot of Johnny Saint in the crowd which is nice that they obviously had that connection with him. Obviously, he is now the general manager of NXT UK. Right, the next match is Enzo and Cass, and they have Carmella in their corner, and they are taking on not the Revival, but Dash and Dawson, who are the tag team champions, and this is a title match. Now, the video package beforehand focuses in on Dash and Dawson's kind of relentlessness since they've come together and won the belt, and the targeting of Big Cass's left knee which kind of put him on the shelf for a few weeks and Enzo and Cass are kind of coming back to exact some revenge. Enzo and Cass come out with Carmella first and oh my god I kind of forgot how over Ed, Enzo and Cass were. The crowd absolutely loved them. The how you doing chants and the soft bit that ah. Oh, it's absolutely deafening. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, I guess. We go from that to Enzo getting kicked off a plane this week because he was vaping. Mm -hmm, how the mighty have fallen. So the Not Revival come out as Dash and Dawson and immediately work over Enzo before he tags Cassin, who has a bit of a flurry. And you kind of think, oh, now they're going to focus in on his knee. But he then leaves and Enzo comes back in. It actually becomes a very back and forth match with a lot more going to Enzo and Cass than I thought there would be. I was assuming that the Not Revival were going to manage to isolate him quite quickly or Cass and work on his knee pretty much from the beginning because that's what they were putting over on commentary and uh, in the video package. But it takes... Enzo diving to the outside and taking them out then when all three guys recover that's really then when they isolate Enzo and it's sort of this time that the commentary are putting over the fact that Enzo, Cass and Carmen are a family and they do everything together and where would any of them be without the other ones well it turns out without Enzo and Cass Carmella would be um, a money in the bank winner and a SmackDown Women's Champion while the other two are released. Without Cass ever winning any gold at all, in fact. After the isolation of Enzo, he does manage to get the hot tag in. And this is then after Cass's quick kind of comeback, they are able to isolate his knee and work on that for the rest of the match couple of near falls here and there towards the end, the last of which being when Enzo splashes down on Dash and Scott Dawson pulls Enzo out of the ring at the two count. Cass obviously then gets in his face and uh, Dawson uses Carmella as a human shield as Enzo kind of gets back into the ring. And because of that distraction with Carmella, Dawson is able to lay Cass out using the ring post. They hit kind of a top rope shatter machine. I don't think I've ever seen them do it again. But they hit that on Enzo and are able to retain the tag team titles. Next up we get a quick video package of Nia Jax since she's come in. And just showing her absolutely decimating anyone that has been in the ring with her. Throwing them around the ring, splashes, Samoan drops on them and just walking through any competition she has had. And they're just building up how on earth is Bailey going to be able to survive in the ring against Nia Jax. She's going to get absolutely decimated. This then leads into the video package to hype up the match between Apollo Crews and Baron Corbin. 
Now, there was an NXT number one contenders tournament, and in the, I want to say final, because they didn't actually say, but either the final or semi final, something like that, Apollo Crews was able to beat Baron Corbin, and he eventually became the number one contender. And in his match against Finn Balor, Baron Corbin came out and basically interfered in the match, so it was thrown out. And this was at a point where Apollo Crews was kind of on the verge of winning the match. So obviously Crews has beef with Baron um, because he came that close to winning the NXT title. He as well, super over. I don't think he'd been around very long. I believe at the Brooklyn show earlier in the year that was his uh, debut or at least it was his takeover debut anyway for NXT. So he was very very new to uh, the roster, so you kind of still had that going for him. Again, oh how the mighty have fallen, poor Apollo Crews. Now, I'm starting to see a pattern in how these NXT matches start off. Very, very quick fire for the babyface that immediately gets snuffed out by the heels. And because looking at it now, I don't really care about either of these guys, which is a bit of a shame. It's starting to be like, can I see something different, please? Although this does lead to probably the line of the night when Baron Corbin is working on Apollo Crews on the outside. He then gets back in and is shouting abuse over the top rope at him. And the best line has got to be, you should have stayed in Ring of Honor. Famously, obviously, he was never in Ring of Honor. Brilliant. Because what they're basically telling the story with Baron Corbin is that he's kind of been hand-picked by WWE and NXT. He hasn't gone round these naff high school gyms, working around the world in all these stupid, pokey little independent um, organisations. He's come into the big leagues because he's that damn good. And he doesn't care that Apollo Crews has spent years and years and years on the road working for that organisation or that organisation. And not even just Apollo Crews, but the other guys that have been over in Japan and worked in Europe. Baron Corbin is like, I don't care about any of that. I've got no respect for you for doing that. I'm as good as I am because I was just handpicked to be put in this position. And I quite like that character. And that plays into the fact as to why he was the lone wolf. And I kind of miss that from him. Although... As a GM, he's doing pretty well. He went through quite a wobbly period, um, certainly over on SmackDown, where he just they didn't seem to know what to do with him, unfortunately. And I think possibly if he'd have won the Intercontinental title around WrestleMania 33, that would have been that kind of first step on the ladder, and it never happened, unfortunately. So still kind of trying to reboot him now. Towards the end of the match, when Apollo Crews has managed to fight his way back in, he gets kind of caught out with a deep six, and we get a near fall. This then leads into an end of day's attempt, but Apollo Crews kind of manages to flip all the way round and land on his feet. He then hits Baron Corbin with a kind of a jumping roundhouse kick, um, and does his standing moonsault for a near fall. And this is kind of when you feel, right, he's got it now. But Baron Corbin kind of manages to block everything that Apollo Crews is doing, kind of holding onto the ropes a lot. And as Apollo Crews is going for kind of a powerbomb move, Baron Corbin is able to kind of throw him off by holding onto the ropes, picks him up for an end of days and wins the match. One other thing I will say about this I miss Baron Corbin's original music. I don't think his new stuff is as good as his old stuff. But again, that's just my opinion. It's video package time, this time advertising the return of Sami Zayn, who the commentators say has been out for about five months or so with a shoulder injury, and he will be back in the next couple of weeks. Naya then has an interview backstage. And just as she is sort of starting to answer, she stops herself because she sees Asuka just kind of standing and looking at her off camera. So she makes her way over to Asuka and there's a bit of a stare down. And Asuka just kind of leaves with a wry smile on her face. Naya returns to the interview and just says that she is going to do to Bailey what she's been doing to everyone on the roster. And that is dominate and destroy. 
again just putting over what we'd already seen in the video package how on earth is Bailey going to manage to survive the onslaught of Nia Jax this then leads into Bailey's own video package it sort of starts just before she wins the title from Sasha Banks obviously we then see that huge moment at Brooklyn and the rematch as well at TakeOver Respect and then it kind of shows everybody else on the roster it Bailey coming in as this champion with Charlotte, Becky and Sasha leaving kind of signalled a, a new chapter in the women's division and she is kind of at the top and all these other women, Alexa Bliss who hadn't really been in the title picture beforehand, um, obviously Nia Jax just coming in, people like Emma and Dana Brooke are all now kind of lining up for their opportunity against her now that the kind of old guard have moved on to the main roster this is kind of their time to come up and she actually makes a point of saying it was a hard long road winning this belt I have a feeling it's gonna be an even longer one trying to keep hold of it which she does manage to do for a hell of a long time so yes it is time for Nia Jax versus Bailey and although Bailey is over as hell after all this is where the hey Bailey chant comes from um, there is no real heat for Nia Jax at all I don't know whether that's just because she's too new to the brand um, but people just didn't really seem to care about her at all she was just sort of there I guess the feeling was that because Bailey had only just won the belt and had kind of finally overcome her her arch rival in Sasha Banks that this was just going to be a kind of transitional match onto her next challenger. Now what was quite nice about this match is we didn't get the huge babyface fire at the beginning. Bailey did get a few shots in here and there, but it was very, very short-lived, and Nia Jax was able to kind of dominate her pretty much from the beginning, arguably all the way until the end, really. And there were a couple of times when, realistically, she should have won the belt. There was a time when she hit Bailey with three Samoan drops in a row and really cockily pinned her. Like, I think that was the foot to the chest and Bailey was able to kick out. A little bit later on, there were three leg drops on the back of, like, Bailey's neck and head area. And again, it was a kind of cocky pin, just kind of putting her hands on Bailey's shoulders. And she kicked out from that. And the way the commentators kind of got around it was just Nia Jax's uh, arrogance and her lack of experience costing her. But really, why you would ever like pin like that is absolutely ridiculous, even if you're kind of a novice. It kind of made her look really stupid, to be honest. Nia Jax then just sort of carried on as she had in her other matches, splashes into the corner, um, just throwing Bailey around the ring here and there, and it got to a point where Bailey was just managing to kind of get a guillotine hold on Nia. And Nia threw her off twice into quite vicious looking spine busters. And as she went down to either pin her or pick her up to do another big move, Bailey got the guillotine hold on again. And the final time, Nia wasn't able to kind of throw Bailey off. And Bailey got the hold in properly. Brought Nia Jax down to her knees and then to a seat in position. And after a minute or two, Nia Jax taps out and Bailey manages to win by submission, something I really didn't expect. Obviously I wasn't expecting to see the Bailey to Belly because obviously of the size difference. So I was assuming that Bailey was going to be hitting the top rope elbow, but that wasn't to be. I don't think Bailey I've seen her win by submission ever since then. Um, but I might be mistaken but it was quite a nice twist and although the crowd wasn't really into Nia and to be honest watching her in this it doesn't really look like she's kind of improved much obviously with the whole Becky Lynch issue this week as well maybe she does need to go back to um, developmental I feel like she kind of needs to work on her moveset a bit because 
literally all she does even still is some leg drops some corner splashes some mum and drop and that's about it it's really boring to watch in the context of this show at least it was a different structured match and because everybody was just so into Bailey, it was quite fun watching that crowd reaction to her and it was a nice feel good moment to see her retain her belt we have one final video package building up the Finn Balor Samoa Joe main event. Now these two were tag team partners and they managed to win the inaugural Dusty Rhodes Memorial Cup and there was kind of this friction between them at the end because Samoa Joe was kind of coveting Finn Balor's NXT title and was kind of protecting him a little bit but kind of making him aware like come on you're the champion I had been dominant since I started here we could have a really good match for this and to be honest I think you kind of owe that to me when are we going to have this match and Finn Balor actually says look I've got no issue with that I will face you whenever and it's actually William Regal that kind of inserts himself into this and says mm, that's not how this is working we've got a tournament to actually decide the next number one contender and obviously that ends up being Apollo Crews and it's kind of this that leads Samoa Joe to kind of snap he feels betrayed by Finn Balor and is willing to kind of throw their 10 year history that they've had outside of NXT um, he's willing to throw that aside for a shot at the title now what was quite nice was although obviously Joe was coming out as a heel the crowd were very much embracing him as a heel even though it was quite a smarky audience they were able to accept that he was the heel and Finn was the babyface obviously I suppose having Finn as the babyface does help with that but although they were kind of cheering him as he came down and doing the whole Joe 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 it was clear that they were very much behind um, Finn performing well and holding on to his belt in fact the crowd were so into this match we got a this is awesome chant before the bell had actually rung now my only main issue with this match is its same sort of structure as most of the other ones Bala comes out of the blocks very quickly Samoa Joe is able to kind of take control on the outside and then works it into kind of a ground based game the good thing with this is obviously the two in the ring are kind of better workers than what we've seen from most of the rest of the show and Samoa Joe working over Finn kind of on the mat looks a lot better um, it's kind of nice to see it's, it's almost it's kind of just a little bit elevated above what we saw from Emma and Asuka right at the beginning of the night. It kind of mirrors that. I did quite like that first match, um, possibly because it was all fresh. But seeing it again here, it kind of freshened it up again and I was able to kind of forget about the middle couple of matches where we were getting the same sort of thing. Purely because of obviously Samoa Joe and Finn Balor's ability to work with each other and to work the crowd. This would inevitably work to Finn kind of coming back into the match and obviously the whole near fall bits towards the end. What was nice with this though was how they had protected each guy's finisher. There were times when Finn had gone up for the coup de grace and Samoa Joe got back up to his feet and hit that kind of roundhouse kick that he does while he's kind of still holding on to the ropes. There were times when Samoa Joe had Finn in what was going to be the muscle buster, but Finn manages to fight his way out of that. There was a time when Samoa Joe actually managed to get Finn Balor in the Kikina clutch, but because he wasn't able to bring him down onto the mat and kind of wrap his legs around him, Finn Balor kind of worked his way over to the ropes and used those to kind of climb up and flip over Samoa Joe and work out of the hold because he pinned him to the mat and Joe was able to kind of let go before he was pinned. So that was quite nice how they'd kind of scouted each other's movesets and rather than having people kind of easily get out of the submission holds or kick out the finishers, they were able to counter them 
because they managed to kind of out wrestle their opponent at that point so that was really really nice to see and as i said manages to protect the guy's finishers and it was in fact the last sort of muscle buster attempt that was up on the um corner it was actually up on the top rope Finn manages to kind of fight out of that and throws Samoa Joe down to the mat, hits the coup de grace and retains the NXT Championship. So overall it was a pretty good show. The matches themselves in isolation were very, very fun to watch. It was nice that the crowd was so into all of the baby faces, even Apollo Crews and Enzo and Cass. Um... It was nice to see Emma in an NXT ring again, working really, really well. It was really weird to have Dash and Dawson not be the revival, although there was mention of them kind of reviving the NXT tag team division, so I'm presuming that's kind of when this name starts then getting used a bit more. Only real negatives... The Nia Bailey match, well, it was okay, it was nice to see Bailey win, but Nia was just really, really uninspiring, and it's a shame that she hasn't really developed from that. I much preferred the Asuka Emma match earlier in the night, and just kind of the repetition of the way the matches were structured. The one good thing about the Nia Jax Bailey match, as I said, was the fact that it was structured completely differently from the rest of the card. And then, obviously, in the main event, especially the protection of the finishers. There was a bit of that earlier in the night, especially in the Asuka Emma match. Emma didn't even manage to hit a finisher at all, and the Asuka lock was um, the only reason that that wasn't um, kind of the way that Asuka won was because Dana Brooke was up on the apron, but we did actually see Emma tap out to it, so that again keeps that move very, very strong. So yes, overall is a pretty good show. Certainly not one of NXT's uh, kind of better shows. It probably ranks closer to the middle, but it's still very, very nice to see. Especially the likes of, say, Apollo and Baron being so over with the crowd. As I said, good to see Emma in an NXT ring. Um, it's always nice to see Finn Balor actually utilised properly, and that is a real shame that he's not at the moment. So, yeah, a pretty good show overall. Now, in January, obviously, we will have another NXT TakeOver show, so I will be doing another review. And this time, keeping it British, I will be reviewing the first NXT TakeOver Chicago, purely because that was the night that Pete Dunne beat Tyler Bate for the WWE United Kingdom Championship. But until then, I have been that British guy, and I will see you very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>